you've probably never heard of gum arabic. It comes from the acacia tree. And I can guarantee pretty much that at some point you've had it in your food or one of the beverages that you enjoy. Sudan is the world's biggest producer of gum arabic. But because of its recent political troubles, a lot of the international buyers are backing off. James Kopner has this report. It's a shape and a taste familiar here in Khartoum and all over the world. But Coca-Cola, as well as its great rival Pepsi, and many other fizzy drinks and foods all rely on a key ingredient you may not even have heard of, gum arabic. To get gum arabic, you have to head out into the central belt of this great agricultural country in inhospitable land on the edge of the desert. Acacia trees, which produce the gum, flourish in this unlikely setting. So, what exactly is the point of gum arabic? Well, once you get it out of these acacia trees, it doesn't look like much. Crucially, it doesn't smell like much either. That means that you can add it to foods, beverages, even medicines, and it acts as a stabilizer or it carries flavor without affecting the taste of the product. It helps add fizz to drinks and is used in sweets and even as a lickable adhesive on postage stamps. The farmers who live here in the state of Gedaref, to the east of Khartoum, work long hours under a scorching sun. They cut into the acacia trees to leave a gaping wound. Each tree will take up to four years to recover. Over the next 45 days or so, gum will seep out of the wound, forming a hard bubble the tapper will come back to collect. The skill, handed down from father to son, is in knowing when the tree is ready to be cut and how long to leave the gum to get the most possible. After it's removed from the tree, the gum arabic is laid out in the sun so some of the water it contains evaporates. But it's not profitable work. In a good year, a tapper might earn 3,000 Sudanese pounds, about $1,350. This isn't enough for all of my needs, but it does support me. I'm a farmer, and the gum arabic helps me support my family. The gum arabic simply isn't doing as well as it should. Hundreds of thousands of people depend on it, but the industry is in trouble. It's not producing as much as it should, and people simply aren't buying as much as the Sudanese would like. In part, that's due to the internal politics of Sudan. It opens actually in, in, in March, okay. in March or end uh, February. Okay. This farmer, who says he has planted 34 million trees, still hopes to make his fortune. But he admits recent problems, including two different civil wars, haven't helped. Sudan is something of a pariah state. Under American sanctions and with its president wanted by the International Criminal Court for alleged war crimes in Darfur, in the west of the country. But gum arabic is so important to big American companies like Coke and Pepsi that it is one of the few things exempted from American sanctions. All the same, Sudan's turbulent recent history has hurt the confidence of the foreign buyers of gum arabic. Maybe they have the, the, the you know, they have the right to get worried and, uh, you know, uh, if I were them, I would get worried if there is, you know, the country which supplies me is having some problems, whether, whether political or social or whatever, because this will affect the continuity of the supply, the availability of the material in time, and the prices, of course, of the material. And that's why maybe some of the Europeans, they try to find uh, places, you know, uh, uh, to replace Sudan, maybe the neighboring countries. Back in the capital, they're trying to overcome obstacles like these. The Sudanese capital, Khartoum, was pretty much built on the profits of agriculture. Now, a new Sudan is springing up thanks to a relatively recent discovery, oil. Once the petrodollars started flooding in, and as Sudan suffered through a succession of civil wars, agriculture got a little bit forgotten. But now real efforts are being made to revitalize the sector, and in particular, gum arabic. The industry has been liberalized and a new regulatory board set up. It estimates exports are at only 10% of the possible maximum, though Sudan remains the world's biggest producer. One plan is to target new markets in Asia and the Arab world. At the moment, almost all of the gum arabic is bought by the West. But first, the sector needs to be modernized to allay the fears of the buyers nervous about Sudan's lack of stability. But we believe that we need to do more. So we are planning now, have already started, to establish a new international electronic bourse and to modernize our local markets and connect this in a network with the international bourse so that uh, 
the international market uh, get all the information promptly. The Gum Arabic Board estimates 5 million people depend at least in part on Gum Arabic income as each farmer supports a large family. They will be desperately hoping the efforts to boost the industry work. James Copnell, BBC News, Sudan. And that report brings us to the end of part one of Africa Business Report. Sudan, the tensions and the violence between rival tribes has claimed thousands of lives. Over the weekend, officials say that another 140 people were killed in the southern part of the country. The news comes as a group of aid agencies is warning that the country could return to civil war if the international community doesn't act to strengthen the peace deal, which was hammered out in 2005. BBC's Mike Aldridge has more on this enormous challenge facing the country. Still struggling to overcome the legacy of civil war that left two million people dead, four million uprooted and destabilized the region, southern Sudan is now once more at a crossroads. In April, the first multi-party elections in 24 years are due to take place here as well as in the north. And nine months later comes the landmark referendum in which southerners will vote on whether to separate from the north or keep Africa's largest country united. But in their report today, the aid agencies talk of a lethal cocktail of rising violence, chronic poverty and political tensions, leaving the five-year-old peace deal on the point of collapse. More than 2,000 people have died in very brutal clashes in southern Sudan. The violence has really been shocking and it can't continue. There is a risk of, further, um, of a further escalation around the elections and in particular the referendum. And it's very important that the international community and Sudan's neighbours who played such a critical role in brokering the 2005 peace agreement now re-engage to prevent another war in Sudan. And while the British government believes a return to full-scale conflict can be averted, it too says the risks are real. There is time if we have the political will, if we instigate political dialogue uh, and interventions by the international community generally, then I think that we can avert what would be a terrible, terrible disaster for the people, the very resilient people of Sudan who have suffered such a great deal over so many years. Many of the fears for the future of this severely war-damaged nation are based around the failure after five years of the peace agreement to resolve key issues to do with the demarcation of the border between the north and the south and competition over resources, especially Sudan's increasingly important oil revenues. Oil revenues, of course, are, are a huge issue. Currently, 85% of the oil revenues are, are generated in the south, so it clearly is an issue as far as independence and cessation from the north uh, is concerned. However, I think there is an understanding uh, in the north, there is an understanding uh, generally in Sudan and indeed in the whole region that th there has to be peace. We can't see uh, further conflict and war of the kind that they've endured in the past. The hope Glenis Kinnock will take with her to this country where the number of women who die during childbirth is among the highest in the world and one in seven children die before their fifth birthday is that northern and southern Sudanese politicians recognize a shared interest in avoiding the devastating consequences of a return to war. Mike Aldridge, BBC News. For centuries, camel caravans have crisscrossed the Sahara Desert making the gruelling trek to the region's salt mines. But now what has served as a rite of passage for the nomadic culture is under serious threat. A recent drought is taking a serious toll on the camels and more efficient means of transport are being sought. The BBC's Africa correspondent Andrew Harding has gone to the city of Timbuktu where they're reluctantly adapting to the changes. It's a gruelling journey at the best of times. Camels bringing giant blocks of salt from an ancient mine deep in the Sahara Desert. Groaning like some creature out of Star Wars is Lakmar, a veteran salt hauler. But the 1400 kilometer round trip is getting harder for him every year. These salt slabs have not changed in centuries, but the weather has. It's getting more difficult because the rains aren't coming and the camels get tired and thirsty and can't continue. But these can, 
The modern world is finally catching up with the salt trade and transforming it. By camel, the round trip to the salt mines used to take about 45 days, but in a truck like this, they can do it in about a week. And in the space of a few short years, the trucks have taken over more than half the salt business. The salt market in Timbuktu. From here, these blocks are shipped all over West Africa. But salt trader Halis al Hassani says it's not the same by truck. The camel caravans were a vital part of the local nomadic Tuareg culture. Loading up for another trip, these miners will spend six months digging the salt out by hand in blistering hot conditions. Thanks to the trucks, the industry is now more profitable. But Sheikh Ould Bakai says he still feels guilty about selling his camels. Andrew Harding, BBC News, Timbuktu. The point of gum Arabic. Well, once you get it out of these acacia trees, it doesn't look like much. Crucially, it doesn't smell like much either. That means that you can add it to foods, beverages, even medicine. Of gum Arabic. But because of its recent political troubles, a lot of the international buyers are backing off. James Kopner has this report. It's a shape and a taste familiar here in Khartoum and out into the central belt of this great agricultural country in inhospitable land on the edge of the desert. Acacia trees, which produce the gum, flourish in this unlikely setting. So, what exactly is You've probably never heard of gum arabic. It comes from the acacia tree. And I can guarantee pretty much that at some point you've had it in your food or one of the beverages that you enjoy. Sudan is the world's biggest producer. All over the world. But Coca-Cola, as well as its great rival Pepsi, and many other fizzy drinks and foods all rely on a key ingredient you may not even have heard of, gum arabic. To get gum arabic, you have to head...